Coming up on this Friday edition of Daybreak, President Park Geun-hye garners ASEAN support for a peace initiative in Northeast Asia. After wrapping up her summit schedule in Brunei, the president is now in Jakarta, where she'll meet with her Indonesian counterpart on Saturday. The Bank of Korea revises down next year's growth outlook to 3.8%, citing external uncertainties such as the US Federal Reserve's expected tapering of its bond-buying stimulus program. The key interest rate is kept at 2.5%. Plus, ahead of their meeting with the President Thursday, U.S. Republicans offer a short-term increase in the debt ceiling in return for negotiating ways to resolve the 10-day-long government shutdown. Daybreak begins now. You're watching Daybreak on Friday, October 11th, and I'm Choi Yusan here in Seoul. We begin with President Bakune's trip to Southeast Asia. The president arrived in Indonesia for a state visit Thursday after wrapping up her stay in Brunei, where she was able to earn regional support for her key policy of building trust with North Korea. Our presidential correspondent Oh Jin-ju reports from Jakarta. President Park has won support from ASEAN member countries for her push to set up a system for multilateral dialogue in Northeast Asia, one of her key North Korea policies. The plan aims at boosting political and security cooperation in the region based on trust, an expansion of the region's original focus on economic cooperation. Korean Deputy Foreign Minister Lee kyung soo told reporters that President Park, during the ASEAN Plus 3 summit on Thursday, stressed that the plan will create synergy with ASEAN's long-term goal of creating an economic bloc in East Asia called the East Asian Community, benchmarking the European Union. The ASEAN Plus 3 leaders also adopted a revised work plan, which contains a blueprint for regional cooperation until the year 2017. 동아시아 공동체 달성을 위한 구체적인 계획을 만들고 실천에 옮기는 것이 무엇보다 중요하다고 생각합니다. 한국은 그 과정에 적극적으로 참여해 나갈 것입니다. Later in the day, the Korean president took part in the East Asia Summit attended by 18 nations, including the United States, China, Japan and Russia. There, regional leaders agreed to work closely together on broader global issues such as climate change, disaster management and food and energy security. In particular, the 18 EAS member nations threw support behind President Park's trust-building process with North Korea and emphasized the importance of completely denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula. Before heading to Jakarta, Indonesia, President Park also met with U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, who attended the EAS on behalf of President Barack Obama and the two exchanged views primarily on North Korea, including its nuclear weapons program. Sales diplomacy will be the key focus of President Park's three-day state visit to Indonesia, the largest economy in the ASEAN region. During her bilateral summit with Indonesian President Susilo Bambang Yudhoyono, the two leaders are expected to discuss ways to further strengthen their economic cooperation, especially in trade and investment. Oh jin Arirang News, Jakarta. The United States and China have reaffirmed their commitment to see North Korea completely abolish its nuclear weapons program. The U.S. State Department says Chinese Premier Li Keqiang and U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry meeting on the sidelines of a regional summit in Brunei also talked about boosting cooperation on the matter and ways to pressure the North to return to negotiations. The two sides then agreed negotiation itself is not the ultimate goal, but a negotiation with a true intent to end the nuclear program and verify the termination. Pyongyang insists on promptly resuming international talks on its nuclear program without preconditions, but Washington and its allies say North Korea should first take some concrete action towards denuclearization before dialogue can occur. 
Some mixed news on the South Korean economy. The country's central bank has revised down its 2014 growth outlook to 3.8 percent. The nation's trading sector, however, will post an expansion in its current account surplus by $10 billion this year compared to an earlier forecast. Our Hwang Jie has the details. The Bank of Korea on Thursday raised its outlook for the current account surplus this year to 63 billion U.S. dollars, up 10 billion dollars from its July estimate. This comes amid a gradual recovery in exports, which rose each of the past three quarters compared to the same quarter last year. Weak demand in the domestic economy also led to a slowdown in imports. Although the central bank expects next year's current account surplus to reach $45 billion, smaller than this year's forecast, experts say it's still a healthy number. It's mainly coming from the import increase, actually, which is good. As the domestic market recovers, like import increase, okay. With regard to the overall growth outlook for the Korean economy next year, the central bank cut its forecast to 3.8 percent, down 0.2 percentage points from its earlier outlook. Despite the cut, the number is still greater than this year's growth forecast of 2.8 percent, suggesting that Korea will be able to maintain a moderate recovery next year. The central bank's revised down outlook came after the International Monetary Fund cut its growth forecast for the global economy. The Korean economy is heavily reliant on exports, meaning that it reacts very sensitively to external factors. It would have been very odd if the central bank of a country like Korea hadn't changed its growth forecast in response to the IMF's revised outlook. The BOK governor added that the uncertainty surrounding the U.S. budget standoff and the planned tapering of the Federal Reserve's bomb-buying stimulus pose downside risks. Korea's central bank, meanwhile, kept its wait-and-see stance for the fifth straight month in October, leaving its key interest rate unchanged at 2.5 percent. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. A growing number of Korean companies believe they will run into funding difficulties in the fourth quarter of this year. The Korea Chamber of Commerce and Industry said on Thursday that its index, measuring the funding outlook for 500 businesses, stood at 92 for the October to December period. A figure under 100 means the firms have a negative funding outlook. The figure has remained below 100 since the third quarter of 2011. The chamber says conglomerates have generally reported sound cash flows, while small and mid-sized companies complain of difficulties in selling their stocks and bonds. The registration of candidates for the October 30th by-election began on Thursday and will run through this Friday. The parliamentary seats are up, two parliamentary seats are up for grabs, one representing the Hwasong A district in Gyeonggi province and the other South Pohang Ulleung Island in North Gyeongsang province. They are both traditional strongholds of the ruling Senuri party. Observers say the outcome of this by-election is likely to be critical for the struggling Democratic Party as it heads toward local elections next June, followed by another by-election in July. The investigation into the authenticity of parts used at nuclear power plants around the country has unearthed numerous cases of fraudulent safety certificates. Nearly 280 quality certificates were confirmed to have been forged. Our Han Daen has more on the findings. The Office for Government Policy Coordination on Thursday announced the results of its probe into a nuclear power plant scandal over forged documents on Thursday. Minister of the OPC Kim dong yeon says an investigation into the nation's 20 operating nuclear plants found that nearly 280 quality certificates were forged. 277 quality certificates were confirmed to have been fabricated, and most of the 7,730 parts installed under those documents have either been replaced or have completed a recertifying process. Regarding a yet-to-be-completed probe on five plants currently being built and three plants that were shut down this summer, Kim said more than 2,000 safety documents were confirmed to have been fabricated. 
The government has indicted some 100 people involved in the scandal so far on charges of document fabrication. The list includes suppliers and certification officials. The former president of Korea Hydro and Nuclear Power Corporation and the vice president of the Korea Electric Power Corporation were also indicted on charges of taking bribes. Minister Kim added, however, none of the plant breakdowns reported over the last 10 years were related to the parts supplied under forged documents. The government has also laid out anti-corruption measures for the nation's nuclear plant industry. The measures include regulating personal exchanges between public officials and suppliers and improving transparency within the current purchasing system. Han Dan, Arirang News. If you want the latest news from Korea and around the world, okay, to return to the negotiation. President Park Geun Hye plan given the current circumstances. On your way to work or at home, Defense Ministry. the legislature will convene a. Tune into Daybreak on Arirang TV. Prime Minister Shin Do Abe said Tuesday. Turning to the budget fight in the U.S. now, the government shutdown there has entered its 10th day. Republicans said Thursday that they're planning to offer a short-term debt limit plan in the hope of jump-starting fiscal talks with President Obama. House Republican leaders are proposing a six-week increase in the nation's $16.7 trillion debt ceiling as a way to stave off the country's default. The White House refused to say whether President Obama would sign a short-term debt limit increase if House Republicans do not also reopen the government. Obama has been calling for a debt ceiling increase and temporary spending to end the shutdown before he would hold formal talks with the Republicans. If there is enough support within the Republican Party, then the House could vote as soon as Friday. Korea's ties with Japan are likely to be stretched to the limit again next week as a group of Japanese politicians are reportedly planning to pay their respects to Japan's war debt at the Yasukuni War Shrine. Japan's Asai Shimbun reported Thursday that two members of Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's cabinet, Yoshitaka Shindo and Keiji Furuya, have in indicated that they will visit the shrine during the country's autumn festival, which starts next week. Shindo and Furuya were among a group of Japanese lawmakers who went to the shrine on August 15th, the anniversary of Japan's surrender in World War II. The Yasukuni Shrine honors Japan's war dead, including several Class A war criminals. Canadian author Alice Munro has won the Nobel Prize in Literature for 2013. The Swedish Academy in their announcement called her a master of the contemporary short story. The 82-year-old multi-award winning author is often referred to as one of the greatest contemporary writers of fiction. Her books include Dear Life and Dance of the Happy Shades. Monroe is the first Canadian writer to receive the coveted prize in 37 years and only the 13th woman to win the prize since its inception in 1901. Two of Seoul's most happening districts will be alive with music for the next couple of days. This year's Seoul International Music Fair is underway, and as our Park ji -won reports, it promises to be even bigger and better than ever before. Musicians and music professionals from the world over, ranging from the renowned to the up-and-coming, have gathered in Korea for the opening of this year's Seoul International Music Fair, or MUCON 2013. Korea's biggest annual pop music fair got started this year with an opening performance on Thursday evening. The event has drawn in hundreds of global music industry insiders, including some of the biggest names. Four-time Grammy Award-winning jazz guitarist Larry Carton is one of the participants. He will give a master class for young Korean musicians and share his advice. Always play from your heart, and then the listener can get a true um, perspective on your music. In other words, put your ego aside, don't try to show off, don't try to do anything except make the music. But you have to prepare so that you can make your music. 
seasoned music producers and industry leaders with decades of experience have joined discussion sessions and lectures, while they also search for new sounds and voices as showcases. I'm going to choose one band to record, and uh, they're going to come to California, and we'll see. I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of good music here, not just in K-pop, but in other genres as well, I've, I've heard already. The event also offers opportunities for artists and entertainment companies from more than 20 countries to network. Compared to last year, ViewCon has grown in the number of participating musicians and buyers. Some 400 key music industry insiders from the U.S., Japan and other countries are expected to visit the event this year. 54 music bands from Korea and other countries like Singapore and Brazil will hold showcases through Friday at several locations around the Hongdae and Gangnam areas of Seoul. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Move over Google Maps. The Korean government's homegrown mapping service is aiming to provide users with pinpoint navigation of underground subways and even inside buildings, all using state-of-the-art 3D maps. Our Polly has more. The V-World 3D mapping project was first launched nearly three years ago by Korea's Transport Ministry, with the goal of providing high-resolution maps to the public through an open platform. The 3D mapping service is now going underground to tackle Seoul's vast network of subway stations. A side-by-side -side comparison view of the three-dimensional spatial map of Seoul City Hall Station shows that every detail and step has been taken into account. The indoor mapping service also hopes to enable audio directions for individuals with visual impairments so they can better navigate through one of the world's largest subway systems. The 3D maps continue to be updated using highly precise laser measurements and video footage. The government agency is also making efforts to solve GPS tracking problems when users are underground to ensure passengers and tourists alike never get lost. We're now making progress with technology to build a Wi-Fi map as a method to find locations. Furthermore, we are utilizing magnetic sensors to map out the exact characteristics of these buildings. We're also currently developing spatial data to ensure locational accuracy within one meter. The Transport Ministry plans to release a pinpoint 3D navigation system for subway interiors and indoor public areas, including major airports via smartphones early next year. Paul Yi, Arirang News. And TGI Friday, everyone, as we kick things off in the major leagues. Now, after the L.A. Dodgers eliminated the Atlanta Braves in four games in advance to the National League Championship Series, the St. Louis Cardinals eliminated the Pittsburgh Pirates in five games, and Ryan Jin and the Dodgers are set to face off against the Cards. The St. Louis Cardinals finished off the 2013 season with the best record in baseball at 97 and 65. The 1 to 3 punch of Adam Wainwright, Lance Lynn, and Shelby Miller will challenge the Dodgers 1 to 3 punch of Clayton Kershaw, Zach Greinke, and Ryan Jin. Meanwhile, game one kicks off on Friday at St. Louis. And back here in the nation, Game 3 of the first round of the 2013 KBO Playoff Series between the Tucson Bears and the Nexon Heroes will take place later tonight at Chamshir Stadium. And while the Tucson Bears look forward to a miraculous comeback, the Nexon Heroes are looking for the sweep. Now, Game 3 starters here, No Gyeong Eun for the Tucson Bears and Oh Jae Young for the Nexon Heroes. So far, the series has been a pitcher's duel with the first two games ending on a walk-off hit win. While the Tucson Bears have come back two games down before against the Lotte Giants back in 2010, this is a different team in the Nexon Heroes. Now, the Nexon Heroes are quite possibly the scariest team in the postseason as they look forward to advancing to the next round against the LG Twins. 
And moving on to football, tomorrow night at the Seoul World Cup Stadium, the Taeguk Warriors are set to face off against Brazil in a friendly, and it's going to be a big test for the young Korean squad. However, during Brazil's training yesterday, Neymar seems to have injured himself during practice but will not affect his match on Saturday. And this is good news as many fans look forward to the matchup between the Brazilian star and Korea's very own Son Heung Min, who's having a great season so far in Germany. While Brazil is the heavy favorite going into this match, it should still be a great test for Korea as they continue to prepare for the 2014 Brazil World Cup. Well, this weekend's a huge weekend for all you basketball fans here in the nation as the 2013-2014 KBL season tips off on Saturday. While Ursan Mobis Phoebus are the defending champions this season, it's going to be a difficult test trying to defend that title. Now, so far, experts choose the Ursan Mobis Phoebus and the Seoul SK Knights as the two favorites going into the new season. Now, both teams did face off in the finals last season with Ursan coming out on top, but historically, not many teams have gone to peat. Meanwhile, the surprise favorites this season are the LG Sakers, who really strengthened their team during the offseason with the addition of Moon Tae-jong, Kim Shide, and their top rookie prospect, Kim Jong-gyu. And now finishing things off in the UFC stun gun, Kim Dong-hyun going up against Eric Silva during UFC Fight Night 29, lived up to his nickname and finished off his opponent in a stunning fashion. Now both fighters going into zombie mode in the second round of the match until the 32-year-old stun gun nails in, dropping him down to the ground and gets the KO victory. Now Kim dong yeon who's notorious for not being able to finish his fights, finally get a KO win here as he also earns $50,000 after getting the KO of the night as well. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great weekend, everyone, and see you guys again for your sports needs. Happy Friday, everyone. I'm E.J. Han with your latest weather forecast. Well, I hope you enjoyed mild, somewhat summer-like afternoon yesterday. And it's drizzling outside in Seoul along with thunder and lightning. And this light rain will make afternoon highs a lot cooler than yesterday. So have a jacket and umbrella handy if you're in Seoul and surrounding areas. But the rest of the country will enjoy gorgeous autumn weather all day long. Well, right now we're looking at patches of clouds that are hovering in these central regions and this dropping light rain to the Seoul capital areas, but it should all clear up in the morning hours. While southern provinces are waking up to partly to mostly sunny skies, hardly no rain clouds in that area. And as we're heading into the afternoon, the, all the clouds will move out from the peninsula and it will turn into a sunny Friday. So let's look forward to that. Uh, tomorrow, plenty of sun will stay to go around with nice dry air, a little bit on the cooler side of the average, but tomorrow afternoon should be warmer than today and the weather outlook for Sunday is looking great as well so if you have planned to take a short trip over the weekend it's going to be a perfect sunny weekend getaway but temperature fluctuation will continue to be a trend in the upcoming days so let's be careful not to get sick with that it's time to take a look at the readings for today Our morning lows should be similar to yesterday but afternoon highs in Seoul will only get up to 21 degrees Celsius, which is 70 degrees in Fahrenheit, but the current temperature in Seoul is about 20, so it shouldn't be that much different in the afternoon as well. And the high in Daegu and Gwangju will top out at 23 and 25, and Busan should enjoy summer-like weather in the afternoon as well today. Uh, let's see how other regions are looking. It looks like lower temperatures are starting out in the upper teens for these regions as well. Uh, afternoon highs in Jeju, Daejeon, and Tokdo will hike up into low to mid 20s. Now that's all for Korea, and here's the global forecast for our viewers around the world.
That's all for me at this hour. Enjoy your Friday morning commute and hope you have a great day. And that does it for this Friday edition of Daybreak. Stay with us throughout the day as we bring you the latest headlines.